Well, good morning and welcome to First New Hope Baptist Church where everybody is somebody in the sight of God. We greet you in the matchless name of Jesus, who is our Lord and he is our Savior. For I was glad when he said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. On this day, is there anybody else happy just to have another day where you can give him the highest praise of hallelujah? God has been good to us. Thank you, God, for being God all by yourself. And you know what? If it had not been for our, him on our side, where would we be? Come with me, go with me right now for our call to worship as we get ready to go into the King James Version of Psalms 121, one through eight, where we will have a reading and then I will have a prayer and invocation to give to get us going on our services today. The word of God says to the people of God, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He will keep thee, will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. Uh, the sun shall not smit thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. May God bless the hearers and doers of his holy word. Let us go to God in prayer. Bow your head and pray with me now as we, we lift up our Father. Our Father and you are our Father, we are your children. God, we thank you for another beautiful day. We're thanking you right now for, for winter being over and spring being in the air. We thank you right now, God, for, for COVID settling down and you having everything under your hands and in your feet. We thank you for stomping out bad things in our life and God blowing life into a body such as this, God. We need you in our hospital bed. We need you in our prison bars. We need you in our nursing home. We need you in our homes, God, with our wives and with our husbands. We need you with our children today going to school, God. We can't go and do this without you, God. We thank you right now for giving us your son, Jesus Christ, who we celebrate today. You say, God, do this in remembrance of me, God. We're going to remember you in the work that you've done for us today. God, we don't take it lightly that you've been a great God. We don't take it lightly that you've been our bridge over trouble. And we don't take it lightly that you've been a way maker, God. So you be God and we'll be your children, God. Let us be your children that you forgive and you show us grace and you show us mercy. Thank you for your twins, God. And God, let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. We give you the praise, the glory, and the honor, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Let all the people of God say amen. We're going to have some announcements. We're just so pleased that our missionary ministry has been truly blessing local ministries. We're going to showcase some of the things they're doing. They help and bless through financial offerings. People who are working in the community who are still helping the, the broken homes and the, the homeless as well as those who don't have the money being those with poverty. So they're gonna bless today, God, the, 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 the Project 516 that keeps helping uh, do amazing work in the region. We're gonna bless today, God, the um, um, uh, Love Thy Neighbor, who's doing food pantry work, help feeding the poor, and Louisiane uh, Hope House, who's continuing to look at those for domestic violence. God, we're gonna bless Empowerment House, who is also working in to help those with violence, domestic violence as well, God. We know that there's brokenness all around, God, but we want to work in conjunction with those who are working with us. So as they look at these announcements, keep them and remember them. Also govern yourselves accordingly. We're going to have a prayer today. 
by Lady Yvonne. We're going to have selection by our Minister of Music as she brings us forth. And I'll come back later with a song. No, I'm just kidding. I'll come back later with the word of the day coming from Mark the ninth chapter, the 14th to 24th verse. Be blessed and know that this is a place that we love everybody and everybody's welcome. We accept you where you are and we will take you from where you're at to meet a savior who will grow you and love you through the word of God. We praise you, we magnify this time and let us worship God in spirit and in truth, amen.
Good morning, First New Hope families and friends. I am Lady Yvonne of First New Hope Baptist Church. I am here this morning to give a morning prayer. Dear Lord, I just want to say thank you this morning. Dear Lord, I want you to continue to bless everyone that is listening to this call that is watching us virtual. Dear Lord, I just want to say thank you. Lord, you are the author and the finisher of our lives. God, you are in control of our lives. Lord, I just want to say thank you. Lord, you are, have been there for us. Lord, you have encouraged us. You have been faithful to us. Lord, I just want to say thank you. Lord, I want you to continue to bless First New Hope, dear Lord. Lord, I just want you to bless the sick and shut in. Lord, I just want to say thank you. You are who we are. Lord, I just want to say thank you. Lord, you are a blessing to all of us. Lord, you are in control. Lord, you know that we have been going through some trials and tribulations, but you are in control of those trials and tribulations that we are going through. Lord, you are, we have to step out and let you be in control. Lord, we have to have that faith that you are there for us. Sometimes we want to step back and we let man come in there, but you are in there for us. Lord, I just want to say thank you this morning. Lord, I want you to continue to look over us. I want you to continue to look over our families and everything, Lord. Lord, I just want to continue because nothing is higher to say thank you. Nothing is higher to say hallelujah. Nothing is higher just to continue to praise your name. Lord, I just, you are an amazing God. God, you are just so wonderful. And in this, what we need in God's name, I pray. Amen. To God be the glory for the great things he's done, that he's doing, and all he will do for you, your family, and your acquaintances. Today is a day that we want to honor uh, the Women History Month, saying that women have been instrumental in everybody's life, to include every man who had a mother or a grandmother, had a sister. Thank God for giving us a woman of his own heart. Thank God for you, my sisters, today. There is a word from a living Savior that I'd like to to bring forth to us today. Uh, I want to bring it from the King James Version from the book of Mark, the ninth chapter, the 14th through the 25th verse I'll be reading today. If you have it, you can respond with amen and you can, can do it as you honor God in your own way, uh, giving reverence to the word of God. You can be silent, you can stand, you can even be seated. But I choose today to honor him in all I do. The word of God for the people of God. It says in the 14th verse, And when he had came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude of them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him, salute him. And he asked the scribes, what question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which had a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he tears him, and he formeth, and gnashes with his teeth, and pinned away. And I spake to the disciples that they could cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and said, O generation, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him straightway, the spirit tore him, tear him, and he fell on the ground and 
wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto you, to him? And he said, of a child. And oftentimes he had cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, if thou can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thy my unbelief. And when Jesus saw the people come running unto him, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thy dumb and foul spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. May God bless the hearers and the doers of his holy word. What a word for the people of God to chew on. Go with me as we go to God in prayer. Our Father, we scratch our hands to you right now. No other help we know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, where can I go? I can go nowhere, God. God, I hear your people. I've been wrestling with this word, God, and I thank you for you giving me a word that they need to hear, God. It may not be pretty. It may not feel good. But God, we've got some unbelief going on right now. Some people are just going through the motion, God. We need to know that you're real every day. And God, if we just trust you and believe in you, God, and get rid of the doubt, all things are possible. So God, I ask you to let me increase only in you. Let me decrease in myself. Let me sit down and you stand up. Let me move out of the way, God, and you take over. Bless my lips, bless my mind, and bless my mouth. But most of all, God, bless my heart so I can be used by you. Bless these, your people of first new hope, God. We give you the praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. To God be the glory for the great things he's done. And for a subject I'd like to use for this, these words, overcoming my unbelief. Overcoming my unbelief. I'm going to preach the next two weeks on doubt. My brothers and sisters, I've been praying for you and I've been lifting you up in prayer and I know life has not been easy over the last 12 months. I know it hasn't been easy, but I can say to you, God has been faithful. I've heard your, your prayers and I've felt your prayers. I've seen your face and I realize that some of us are still hurting more than what we could ever imagine. But we, we were quiet and we just don't know how long this is going to go on. But like Paul, the apostle that God gave to us, I want to point us all back to Jesus Christ. Because through Jesus, he can help our unbelief. The Clark sisters wrote a song that is applicable to the, the sermon today, and it is called, Is My Living in Vain? The song is all about doubt. Words like, is my living in vain? Is my praying in vain? Is my fasting in vain? I have asked the question to myself. Because if you've been praying and you haven't seen a breakthrough, it's going to cause you to doubt. I had to ask myself the question. If you've been reading your Bibles and you wonder if there's a word from the Lord, it will cause you to doubt. I believe that every baptized believer has to deal with the small word called doubt. Help me somebody. It may not be something you want to hear, but, but we've been doubting some things over the last 12 to 15 months. 
But uh, we even wonder, uh, that is the church relevant today? I would say to you, it is, my brothers and sisters. What do you do, church, when your hopes is dashed and all you can see is hopelessness? I don't care if you're strong on the outside. You can be bent and broken in the inside. What do you do, church, when you've had some experiences along the way that have shaped you to have a doubt thought in your mind? I don't care how many battles you have won. The question becomes, how do you deal with the word called doubt? Now, First New Hope Baptist Church knows what I'm talking about. You see, they were without a pastor for over two years. And, and some people left the church, but there was a small group who kept on praying. They kept on Fasting, they kept on calling on the name of Jesus Christ, looking for God to send them somebody of their own heart, of that heart of Jesus. I know they know what I'm talking about because when some people threw in the towel, they kept moving forward, slow, but they kept moving forward. And I just want to remind you today, like we talked about in Bible study, and you need to go to Bible study if I could tell you anything. Ministry must continue, and it's not about a person, but it's about Jesus Christ. It must continue. We find ourselves believing in God, but our situation sometimes gets the best of us. I know you love the Lord because he heard your cry, but you've been dealing with a situation of a lost one during COVID-19, the pandemic. Some of you may have lost your job during this pandemic. Some of you may have lost your homes. Some of you have experienced either that that has caused your faith to increase or has shaken you to your core. Can I take you down your neighborhood or can I just be real today and keep it 100? Some of you have doubted, is God real or is he a myth? Some people doubt that the Bible that was written back in the day was for those people, but we have lived long enough that we don't need to believe what was written because it does not apply to us anymore. Seeds will be planted in our minds that will cause you to have doubt that grows from a seed to a weed. And it's bad, my brothers and sisters, when the people in the world doubt God but it's even worse when we are the body of Christ, doubt God, and start going to the people who don't know God for answers on religious matters. Somebody say amen. Now, if I could use an illustration today, I would use the game show Family Feud to get you right in this sermon. Steve Harvey has a way of coming up and getting competitors to come up and they hit the button together. Go with me and, and just go along because it's going to make sense in a second. See, there's been a survey that, that, that I want to add to this script today. Steve Harvey would have said the survey would have sound something like this. Here we have had a survey that estimates that 75% of the people who responded to the survey in a positive way have wrestled with the term doubt in their life as it relates to God. So would you and Reverend Reed put your hands ready together and give me the top four reasons on what would matter and cause you to have doubt. Survey says in a time of doubt, the first, give me the first answer. And what would be the thing that would cause you to do when you doubt and what do you do? I would hit the button and I'd say, stop going to church. And he would say, survey says, that's 100% right there. Good answer. Everybody would clap and know that we've got three more hard ones to get, but, but it's going to be all right. We would put our hands ready to go on the red button again. And, and, and you might be ready. And you might hit it ahead of me this time. And he would say, the second thing when it comes to doubt, what happens when we get that? And you might beat me to that one. And you could say, we stop 
praying. And he'd say, good answer. That's the second number one answer. And you get a hundred parts also. Then he would say, the third answer is a little bit tougher. But what would happen when you doubt and you have that when it comes to your mind? What's the third best answer? I would beat you to it. And I would say something like, not only do we stop going to church, not only do we, we, we stop praying, but I believe the third answer is we stop reading our Bible. And he would say, good answer there, Reverend, because you hit it on the head. You get 50 points. And he could say, okay, this is the last one. This is the big one. Final answer in the survey is when you have doubt, when you turn to an answer for strength and you don't have it, what does the survey say that the spiritual people do in the church? And you might beat me this time and you could say, the survey says we turn to a friend. And he would say, yes, you got it. So now you're 50-50, you're tied. Great answers. So let me rewind this for these four things I just mentioned in the survey, because the survey was real. You've got a spiritual issue like what's in the text. It sounds ridiculous, but this is how we think, my brothers and sisters. You doubt spiritual matters. So you go to a friend who does not go to church. You go to a friend who isn't saved and don't even know who God is. You go to them to get advice on an emotion that is planted by a seed of doubt and it either causes your, your, your emotion to increase or decrease, but they don't know God for themselves. What kind of ridiculous mess do we do? But that's how we think sometimes. That survey is real. That was a survey that was taken about uh, 10 years ago. Now, millennials, you're, you're, you're writing this, this text, too. You're not exempt. One of the reasons why the population in the church is decreasing is because overall young people have doubted if this thing called religion is real. You feel you're of age now and you've been going to church all your life because somebody made you go. So now you're old enough to say, I go when I want to go. And you can now say that I don't have to go if I don't want to. But the question is today, did God tell you that? Even ourselves, when we point to ourselves, my brothers and sisters, we have doubt creeping in our minds. We wonder if we're smart enough. We wonder if we're talented enough. We wonder if we're good enough to do things other people do. And, and, and I, if I can leave you with anything, saints, today, I would say to you, doubt is not a one-time thing. Doubt is a process that you've got to walk through and you've got to go through all by yourself. We have to get to the point, though, my brothers and sisters, when you can tell yourself, I know it's hard right now, but I still will trust God. I know it looks bad, but God is still my redeemer. I don't understand right now, but God, I will trust you until the end. And, and we have to get to the point that we can say to my unbelief, Jesus Christ, help my unbelief at this time as I'm going through. Am I in your text? Am I in your life? Am I in your Bible? I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, that that this text today can be found in three places in your Bible in the New Testament. Matthew records it in chapter 18. Mark records it like you know in chapter 9. And Luke records it in chapter 9. Therefore, we see that there is three places that God is placing emphasis on the importance of handling your unbelief. It means something to God. Don't miss it. It starts off in this text. In verse 1 of this ninth chapter, Jesus is saying in 1 through 13 that he takes his inner circles up the mountain for transfigurement. He is being transfigured at this point. He shows his glory, which is on display. Now, listen to this, my brothers and sisters. He, 
He picks 12 disciples, but he only takes three up to go up on Mount Figuration. He only takes three up to heal. What does that tell you? That lets me know that not everybody, my brothers and sisters, you should carry at your point of where you're getting glorified. That needs to tell you that your vulnerability should not be known by everybody and not everybody needs to see you in your weakness or see you in your glory. Every now and then you got to leave some people down at the base of the hill while you go up to be with God all by yourself. Can I get one witness today? For he, he took Peter, John, and James as his ride and die crew. But he left the others down on the base of the mountain because he had taught them too. They should have knew something. But it looks like they didn't know anything. See, his father spoke up on that mountain. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And out of nowhere, here comes Elijah and here comes Moses signifying that the prophet was on the scene and the law was there as well. We know that Peter gets down on his knees in Mark 9 and 5 and says, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. But Jesus said, oh, no, this is all about me. Can I, can I stop and pause there for a moment? Suggest that some reasons we are still hurting is because we take the wrong people with us up on the mountain. Some people don't need to speak when you're in the presence of God. You need to let God be God and you just be that servant proud to be there. Next, we, we see the text says Jesus has a high moment. He's, he's glorified. He's shown in white linen. He's, he's, his father is happy. He comes down from the mountain on a high place and he comes down to a mess. Jesus shows off his mountain in this verse 14. The, the other disciples are arguing, it says, with religious people. You see, we have two groups here. One group is relational. And one group is about rules and regulation. All of a sudden, it says a dad from out of nowhere, out of the crowd, the multitude. His name is not known in the text, but it says in Mark 9 and 17, who said these words? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which has a dumb spirit. Now, now I want to stop right there and give this dad some credit. Because he didn't say, well, he, he's got sickness. He doesn't say he's got an issue. He says he's got an evil spirit inside of him. This lets me know that this man might have been reading Ephesians 6 and 12 that says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principality, against power, against the ruler of the darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high place. For he had a wicked son. The wickedness caused him to fall at the mouth and tearing his clothes and he becomes rigid and in convulsions. But here's the part that hurts Jesus the most. The man said, I brought him to your disciples first and they couldn't heal him. The evil spirit couldn't get out of my son. That's why I'm bringing him to you, Jesus, because they couldn't do it. So here's the problem. Jesus had already taught them, and he taught them back when I looked at the research in Matthew 10th chapter. He said to them in 10th chapter, so they were given power and authority over unclean spirit. That's why he follows that up with his being upset. Because he says in this 19th verse, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring the boy to me. Let me take care of this. So let's unpack this sermon and see what thus say the Lord to his people. Because we're still doubting. Verse 19 says, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I 
be with you? How long should I suffer you? Bring him to me. The reasons why the disciples couldn't cure the boy wasn't because they couldn't. It was because they didn't believe. Here's a spiritual demon in the child. And the father has brought this boy to the church. And the church couldn't help. Jesus is upset in the text because he knows that he's going to die soon. He's going to be portrayed soon. He's going to have to leave them soon. And he's taught them, but they're not paying attention. He knows that it won't be long, so how can you lose the power I gave you and the authority I gave you? Matthew 10 and 1 says these words. And when he had called unto him the twelve disciples, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. Doubt has creeped into their minds, though, because these religious leaders told them, you can't do it. Look at verse 20. It says, And they brought him to unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit takes him. And he falls to the ground and he waddles, foaming at the mouth, obviously. The spirit saw Jesus. It, it caused the boy to fall on the ground having convulsions. But it lets us know that the unclean spirit knew that he was in the presence of God. When the disciples forgot that that was the same spirit, though, that Jesus had said that's in me is also in you. My brothers and sisters, don't let nobody talk to you out of your calling of what God has given you. What gifts he has given you and told you or, or what he has shown you, you are. They had an issue going on because when you walk into the room, we should know that that unclean spirit should not feel easy when you got the spirit of the living God inside of you. Because the same authority God gave them, he's given it to you. It's inside of you. But what caused the problem is when doubt is stronger than faith, you have no power. That's, that's the first thing you need to realize. When doubt is stronger than faith, you have no power. But the second thing you need to see in the text is the enemy, that's the, that's the devil right there, knows what's inside of you. That's what verse 20 tells us. They, and they brought unto him the boy. And when they saw him, straightway the spirit takes him and he fell to the ground and waddled foaming at the mouth. The spirit knew what spirit was inside of Jesus. In fact, the word of God says in 1 John 4 and 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. How can the spirit see who Jesus was? Jesus doesn't even talk to the boy, you notice. Now we start to see that he's talking to the dad. So the story is not about the boy having the demon. It's about the father who has no faith, unbelief. And Jesus is letting us know today. He says, what action do I need to take here? He already knows the answer, but he's asking the question. And he does that to us to see if we're paying attention. He says to the unbelief of the father, this question, how long has the, this been going on with this boy? And the father says, of as a child. You see, Jesus knew the answer already because he is all-knowing. We can assume that the disappointment of the years had broken the father down. We, we can make the assumption that he's seen doctors after doctors who couldn't heal his son. We can make the assumption that he's taken the medicine that did not work. But today the father meets the doctor of all doctors. The, the father gives in one more time and he accepts that this is how life is going to be till he meets Dr. Jesus. Help me, Lord Jesus. But now... He takes his son 
to Jehovah Rapha, meaning the God that heals. I wasn't there, but it sounds so familiar, like the woman with the issue of blood, who was bleeding for 12 long years, who had done all she could do. But when she took it out of her hands and placed it in the hands of the master, things started to change. And if you could just touch the hem of his garment, she said, I would be made whole. That's her faith. The father got enough strength to say, I'll try one more time. The father said to Jesus, Master, if you can do anything to help. He was tired of being let down. He was tired of being disappointed. He had lost almost all his hope. But he said to Jesus, from a broken perspective, if you could just have some compassion. One more time, Lord, help my unbelief and heal my son. See, when doubt is stronger than faith, you lose your power. The enemy does know what's inside of you. But what we need to also realize is a third and wonderful point. The man had to reflect that he had the issue with the word called doubt. You got to look at yourself in the mirror. Verse 22 through 23 says, and oftentimes it has cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us, Jesus, and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou can believe, all things are possible to him that loves, that believes. <coughs> Excuse me. The word of God, if I could introduce him to this man, would be, if you can believe, all things are possible. Do you know who you're talking to? You're talking to the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. When you were without peace, this was Jehovah Shalom who gave you peace, my brother. When you were sick, this is the one that gave you healing, the doctor who was in the sick room for you, who never lost a patient. Everything in his hand, he can handle it. You just need to let it go and trust him. Jesus says to the man, all things are possible to them that believe. Many of us have given up on God. Many of us have stopped believing that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we would think or imagine. Something has happened to where you think that God has forsaken you. But my word tells me. That God said, I will never leave you or forsaken you. You have to look at yourself in the mirror, my brothers and sisters, and realize that the issue of doubt is your, your issue. God will never force his way on you. But you've got to remember that it was him who brought you through a long, long way. It was him who kept you when you couldn't keep yourself. Jesus said, all things are possible to them who believe. The dad in the text, I believe he was saying, God, I know you were sent. I believe you can do everything. But sometimes, God, I need to know you're real in my life. That's why I do have unbelief because of the issues I'm going through. This is a personal time in the text. The dad is not looking to the disciples anymore. He's not looking to the religious leaders in the, in, the, in the group. He's looking to the hills where cometh his help for all his help he sees is coming from the Lord. Jesus Christ, all things are possible. Families can be put back together in the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ, you can lose your job today and get a better one tomorrow if you believe in Jesus' name. And, and, and if you believe in him, you could lose the whole world, but yet you could still go to heaven like the thief on the cross. Because in his name, all things are possible if you believe. When doubt is stronger than faith, you will lose your power. 
So hold on to his unchanging hands. When the enemy knows what's inside of you, they'll fight you. You will have battles. But greater is he who is in you than he that's in the world. And finally, you've got to always remember. You've got to reflect that you've got the problem, but you also have the answer in Jesus Christ. So as I press to a close today, my brothers and sisters, I want to tell you about a man that if you discover him, he is the lover of your soul. He will keep you in perfect peace. I'm not going to try to hoop. I'm not going to try to, to psych you up or build you up. I just need you to know like this boy in the text. It was never the question of can he, the, the boy be healed. The question was a struggling father who had doubt. For he doubted because he had years of disappointment. He doubted because he had been let down by man so many times and woman so many times. He's doubting because he spent all his money. But the Bible says in verse 27 of this text of Mark, Jesus took the boy by the hand and lifted him up. He arose. That means the boy was healed right then. No one had doubted who seen that, but the father who was doubting was now without doubt. The boy had a demon. That's the problem. That's a spiritual problem. Let me, let me make that clear. The father had a doubting problem. That's a spiritual problem. But like the survey was saying at the beginning, you can't solve spiritual problems with physical solutions. A friend can't help you when they don't know God for themselves. You need to stay with the one who has a proven track record. Your boss can't help you on the job. They'll fire you tomorrow. But God got you that job. Jesus told them that this only comes through praying and fasting. So the survey says when you have tough times and you think you want to walk away, that's when you need to cling to God. That's when you need to fast and pray and turn from your wicked way. But in all your ways, acknowledge him so he can direct your path. That's when you need to stop looking around, but look to the hills where cometh your help for all your help cometh from the Lord. And when you want to stop going to church, that's when you got to find a way to get to God because your church is in your heart. There is a building, but he said when he gave us the Holy Spirit, it will reside in our hearts. I stop by to tell you that the Bible says that there are spiritual weapons that will solve spiritual problems. That's why he gave us his son, Jesus Christ. Today, if you are without Jesus Christ, today, if you don't know him for the pardon of your sin, this is the day that you can give your life to Christ. This is the day that you can turn it all over to him and let him lead you. Bow your heads and just raise your hands with me. God, I'm a sinner, but I want to be saved. Forgive me of my sins of omission and commission. And give me another chance. God, I give you my heart. I give you my mind. And I give you my soul. And God will bless you. Amen. This is the time that the word of God tells us that we should remember him. This is the time that he says, do in remembrance of me. And we're going to go to our communion service. I believe that God loves his people so much that he gave us his precious blood to seal us in the Lamb Book of Life. I love to use 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, the 23rd through the um, 34th verse. But it tells us that we should pause first and ask for forgiveness for Many are sick among us because of the sin. And many sleep, that means many die. 
So we should pause now and ask God for forgiveness of our sins of omission and commission. Let us do that in our own way. Father, forgive us. Knowing sins and sins not knowing, God. Waking up this morning with a sin on my mind. Forgive me. God, bless these, your people. Bless these people to know that you're still real. And God, let them not doubt you. For they know too much about you. God, bless us in a mighty way. Bless these elements. And we remember, God, you say, do this until we come back again. And we do it in the name of Jesus. God had them in an upper room. He had his disciples there and he fed them and he washed their feet first and he taught them even when he knew they were gonna betray them. He still, he, he, he let the one who was gonna betray him, betray him with his hand in the same dish. Today, we don't wanna be like Judas. We wanna be like the rest, even Peter who, denied him. Today, let us take your elements. Let us break it. Let us pray over it. And then let us eat it together. So let me pray over these elements and then we will eat and commune together. God bless these elements. They're not replacement for your body, but these are examples that you told us, God, do this in remembrance of you. Let us remember that God, this broken bread, represents your body, that this small bit of wine or grape juice represents your blood that was shed for us. But you did it in remembrance of us, God. We thank you for being our God. And the word of God says, and when he had given thanks and he broke it, he, he took it and he said, let us eat together. And what they did was they ate together in communion. And in the same manner, he took a cup, it was a goblet, but we're using just a small glass today. And he said, this cup is the New Testament of my blood, for as often as you do it, drink it in remembrance of me. He said, I can't drink it with you, but we will drink it together in paradise. And they took that cup and they blessed it and they drunk together. Let us commune. And the disciples knew that there was no benediction that day, but they went out singing. So this day, understand that it was the blood that saved you and it keep, it's keeping you right now, even when you have doubt. May God bless you, may God keep you. This is my prayer. And don't doubt God. Know he's able to do exceedingly above you, but all we can think for in that. Amen. Well, it's time for us to look at our stewardship. It's time for us to look at our hearts as God has blessed us to give back a portion of what he has already given to us. And here at First New Hope, we would ask that if you're visiting online and you don't have a local church, please give to our church. If you have a church of your own, we would ask you give to that church. You can give here at First New Hope by just going on Facebook, and going to our account, www.firstnewhopebaptist.com. You'll be able to find our website. You click the menu, go to the give button, and it will be easy. It'll take you right through it where you'll be able to put in your amount, take it to the cash register, and it will pull out, and you will get a receipt uh, that will allow you to see your donation that you gave to the church you're offering. If you want to mail it, you can as well. You can mail it to First New Hope Baptist Church, Post Office Box 356, Spotsylvania, Virginia, 22553. We will take it and we will record it and we will make sure that at the end of the year, if you've given over a certain amount, which we will, um, as our members know, we will give you a receipt so you can file that as well for your taxes. And so giving is part of God's plan. He says, give and it will be given to you.
press down, shaking together and running over. But you gotta first give, so then you can give in return. So, it's the principle of God's word. But stewardship is what he expects from us. Be blessed and give. In Jesus' name, amen.